basketball fans, welcome to the Raptors today. Keel Augustine, Sherm Hamilton, Paul Jones putting away the phone. Ringers off? Ringers off. Okay, we're good. Let's get this thing started. 117 to 105. A huge win for the Toronto Raptors, snapping a three game skid. Let's talk about it because we've seen the Raptors have some furious comebacks as of late that have fallen short, including against the Bucks and other teams. This time they didn't have to do a furious mm. comeback, but they did have to stop a team on their way. Dave Lillard kind of. Um, starting a fire for his Portland Trailblazers team. So, Sherm, I'll start with you. How impressive was it to see Fred, who's been all over the news this week, bang <laughs> those two threes and kind of stop the bleeding for this Raptors squad? It was, you know, it's not a surprise when Fred makes plays like no, that, regardless no. of what kind of game he, he's having to that juncture. He was three of seven from the floor at that point. Yep. The fourth quarter, he goes two of five. But how big were those two shots that he made? So, you know, that's that's maturity, that's the skill level, that's the professionalism of Fred. He He's going to be there when his team needs him, regardless of what happens throughout the rest of the game. And That was a tough catch, yeah, too. absolutely. It was on top of the shoelaces, yeah. he got it up, and that was a better look for him. But just making big plays and the emotion he showed after that shot, I, I don't think there's anything to be surprised about. He does that. I, 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 it was interesting because on the second one, he actually made the play at the other end defensively to start that sequence. And to Sherm's point about the emotion and the yell and the scream, that was reminiscent of Game 6 against Golden State uh, in, in the championship season. Not since then have I seen that kind of emotion from Fred, at, at least at that point after a big shot. So... Um, it, you know, Larry Bird used to say of his of his former teammate, the late Dennis Johnson, I never passed it to him until it was important. Because no matter how bad a game he was having, when the bigger the shot, the more important it was, the more I could count on Dennis Johnson to make it. And I look at Fred, as Sherm says, he comes up big. He makes winning plays. And, you know, he maybe not having a great game. The season's a little bit different. But when it's time, there are guys that are just, they just have a knack for doing that. And I, I put Fred in that category. Those were two huge shots. I mean, Raptors had three separate 19-point leads in the game. Three times they were up 19. And that time, it had been cut down to one possession. It was, uh, it was 97-94. And then Fred makes back-to-back threes, and all of a sudden, the game's done. And it's good to see them in the, the opposite scenario, not the chaser. Yeah. They're yeah. the chasee. They're the people being chased. So, you know, the fact that they were able to throughout the game be able to put themselves in a position that they haven't been able to frequently, have a lead, and not have to chase people down. And, and playing with the lead is different. It's a different approach. And as that lead was being reduced by, obviously, Dame Litter, who's a great player, you could see the Raptors bend but not break. And then Fred comes through in the clutch. So the leadership came through. You know, their toughness came through. And the lesson is, it's better to play with the lead. Yeah. yeah. It's better to play with the lead. And the energy they expend to come back in games usually taps out when it comes to getting over the hump. They don't have to worry about that when they have the lead. So hopefully they can continue to do that and, and put themselves in better positions to finish games. In a sense, shifting from the hunter to the hunted. Mm-hmm. Now, let's yeah. talk about the energy for this group. One of the takeaways, of course, was the moment that people saw uh, from halftime in between Thad Young and Scotty Barnes. But other than that, the energy coming from the bench, especially since this bench has struggled of recent, finally a good game numbers-wise for them. But the energy, Jonesy, that we saw from this bench, guys cheering and actually – at one point, the, the bench was the, was the group that actually took yeah. control of this game. In the second quarter, uh, when Gary Trent was on the junior, uh, Gary Trent Jr. was on the floor with, I think it was Coloco, Boucher, Flynn, and Thad Young, that unit actually increased the lead. I thought they did a really good job. And, and just to address that, you know, as everybody wants to, you're in a family, you have disagreements, yep. you have arguments. It's just not out there for everybody to see. I, I don't know what it was about. They'll work it out. They'll fix it. It might not be fixed today. It might not be fixed tomorrow. It'll eventually get fixed. Just, you know, the great Phil Jackson uh, talked about this in his books about why they never let the media into the full practice. Because he said, that's our time if we want to d- discuss issues. If we're sitting down at a family dinner at the table and there's some stuff we want to talk about, we don't want anybody else around. And, and so this kind of stuff comes out and it comes public and everybody offers an opinion and 
those are the dynamics of a team, of relationship dynamics. It, it happens. So I'm not, I'm not going to pay that a big deal. The, the other part of it, though, to the energy, Akil, the bench had been struggling. And they did a good job yesterday, and it allowed Nick to rest guys longer and, and give them a little bit more of a break because, as Sherm said, when you play with the lead, you can ride that lead. Let these guys, until I know it's going bad or I have to make a change, let it, let it play out. Let it, let it roll. Play with the house money. First of all, who cares about what Thad Young and Scott Barnes, Scotty Barnes had going on? Disagreements, arguments, little dust-ups happen with teams. It's not a big deal. It happens frequently. They're men. They're in an organization or part of a team. You can't agree on everything, and sometimes it no, looks you? more explosive than it really is based on camera. So I don't worry about those things happen frequently. Um, in terms of the energy, this is something we talked about before. The bench needed a guy. That guy was Gary Trent. Got banged up a bit, tried to play him in that second unit. It didn't work out in terms of how great he was as a starter when he began starting again. But now you put him back into that second unit to help that second unit as a designated guy who can go out and get something. It alleviates the pressure from everybody else thinking that they've got to play up a rung on the ladder to try and score. And then, you know, when you just share it down and, and you bear it down to the basic minimums, the bench has to provide energy. If they don't do anything else, they have to bring energy into the game to maintain or raise the level of energy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the bench unit did that. And when that's their focus, look how much easier offensive stuff started to happen. Obviously, Gary Trent was on the floor who could go get it. But all of a sudden, there's flow. The screen setting is sharper. The cuts are sharper. The defense has to react to so many moving parts. And Gary can go and attract double teams and make plays. And all of a sudden now, there's an offensive rebound. There's a cut to the basket. There's all these things that open up. So, you know, you, sometimes you got to get it down to the bare minimum. And the bare minimum is energy. And they brought energy defensively especially. And that created great flow for that unit. I thought it was interesting that Nick – took Gary out early. Yeah. So he could put him back in with the unit. Yeah. Like, you know, people say. Because they need they yeah. need somebody who can go get it. And I'm sure there are people all like, what's he doing taking Gary out? Just there's there's a method here. Just sit back and watch. So I, I thought that was interesting. I thought that was well played. All right, well with more thoughts on the Toronto Raptors bench from Precious Achua, here is Sav Hamilton. <sighs> Thanks, Akil. Of course, a big win for the Raptors today. And we have to give credit to the second unit that also created a really big spark for the team in the second quarter. You know, we saw Precious Achua coming out really aggressive. We saw Coloco taking up space. We saw a lot of challenges in the second quarter, but the, the Raptors, they were resilient and they pushed through it. But let's focus on Precious Achua because he's still coming back from that right ankle uh, ligament tears, partial. Um, you know, there's a lot going on with him and he missed a lot of games. So this is only like his like third game back of believe and so when you think about just how far he has to go and where he's come from so far he's really making some great strides and we saw glimpses of that today as he had four points in six minutes and grabbed two rebounds he had a very strong impact in his first run you know I talked to him also after the game asking how his conditioning is doing and he's he said to me that you know he's feeling okay he's feeling good he wants to get back to where he was before but that also comes with time and opportunity as actually coach nurse spoke about at the end of the game as well he said that he wants to give pressure more time and more opportunity and he wants Precious to be where he was at at the end of last season so hopefully we continue to see more sparks from Precious as the season goes on. Nikhil? We talked about Fred Van Vliet's clutch buckets but it was Christian Coloco with a huge offensive rebound and put back that kind of also helped stem the tide for this Raptors group. Let's talk about Christian Coloco mm -hmm. who's had some minutes taken away from him and definitely had his struggles with the referees Sherm <laughs> but it looks like he's kind of found his opportunity last game to kind of earn some of that trust back from the coaching staff and teammates. He's a young man. He's a rookie. He's going to have the up and downs. And what you can see in him is the template of a player that can impact the team on winning. I like his activity. Of course he's going to get the fouls going against him from officials. He's a rookie. That happens. I think he's got to kind of calm down his conversations with officials. He's not at a point where they're going to listen to him like that. And they're probably going to get more irritated yeah. than have more of a, hey, keep on talking and he's going to let him go. So he's got to be careful about that. But I thought he kept it simple. That big rebound, you're, that big bucket you're talking about, they got into a switch situation, and he just continued to roll to the basket. 
and he used his length, was able to grab that ball and lay it up, and, and it was a big bucket. Plays like those just kind of continue to build the confidence. Late game situations, he's on the floor, he makes a positive play. After getting that technical foul early in the game, which didn't sit well with Nick Nurse, but he made up for it. He did a great job at the end of the game, and, and those are the, the incremental growth spurts that you want to see. The ability to shake off that bad situation, be focused, be ready, make a good decision, set a good screen, roll to the basket, and make a play that helps your team get a W. So I like Christian Coloco and what he brings to this team, and I'm okay with the fluctuations because he's learning. He's young. Yeah. Growing pains. Yeah, yeah. He's, yeah. He's, he's in it. He's in the fire. Uh, you know, I was okay with the technical. I, I was because I thought it was a pretty clean block. Now, there's no doubt it was a clean block. Yeah, it, now, on high, on, on it was a clean take, block. Clean. Now, to me, that was, you know, the referees, t- you know, I've had referees say, oh, Jonesy, come on, we don't ref the back of the shirt, we ref the front. That was refing the back of the shirt. Like, Coloco on the back, Lillard on the back, and they gave the call to the top 75 perennial all-star player. And the young man said, hey, hey wait a minute now. Ben Taylor just happened to be the one, but... Y'all have been doing this to me for too long. I do block shots, and I get some of these, and I get them clean. He can't do it, So though. when are you going to give me some? He can't do it, though. He can't do that. I, I think he needs to speak up. He's ha- he said his piece. Now you're done. Now that has to go to the coaches and other people saying this is what he does. He blocks shots. I, I mean, I didn't like the fact that um, the timing of it, but I was okay with him speaking up. So to his game, though, To Sherm's point, his energy was great. It always is. He just happens to kind of get caught in the wrong spot at the wrong time. Some of those fouls are legit. They're excuse me like he's moving and somebody's moving back and there's a bump and it's kind of a touch foul, but it is a foul. I mean, those things are going to dissipate with experience once he understands and starts getting a better feel for the game. But the only way to do that is to have him in the game. And, yes, his minutes were cut. But yesterday, they needed him. They got good energy from him. I like the fact that Nick throws him in early. Let's see what he has. If he's giving us some, let's give him some more. If not, all right, we'll go and try something else. All right, well, it's time for us to check in with the players post-game. So let's hand it off to the Toronto Raptors. Hit those two threes, the second of those two threes. In the fourth, he kind of gave one of those roars. We don't see all that often. A lot of emotion and how do you feel to kind of get those go down and, and halt that moment and the fourth one was real bad. Just competing, man. Just trying to get a win. And um, again, laying it all out there on the line. That was a big swing. I just airballed one. Um, go down, hit one, do the vertical, get another one. They call a timeout. That was just a big swing there. So uh, just competing and in the moment and, um, you know, trying to find a way to, to get it done. And we were able to do that tonight. You guys were all standing up on the bench, cheering on the guys in the start of the second quarter there. What did that run for that bench you made me for you guys tonight? I just got to keep encouraging them like we talked about before, you know, stay positive. And uh, they responded well. Coach coach gave them a chance, and they, they responded the way you would like to see. So they got to continue to build on that. We need those guys. They they pretty much won us the game tonight um, with that run. And um, they definitely battled again in, in the third and the fourth. Uh, Dame got hot for a couple threes there. But um, I thought they did an incredible job. Our bench was great tonight. And um, we're going to need those guys going forward. Scott, you look like you're pretty determined to get involved in the offense pretty early. Took a couple of shots early, kind of made up some ground between you and Nurkic. Um, how much have you been kind of going over that process the last few games, the way you've been covered? Um, I would say I probably just felt good early. Um, been working on it. Uh, just wanted to step in there with confidence, be able to take a best space, shoot, shoot some. Uh, get to the mid range. I uh, just felt pretty good going early. Um, yeah. So. Does, it, does it help one like Turner, Lopez, uh, Robinson, Nurkic? Like they're not the same type of defense, but you know, similar. Does it help when you see it so many games in a row and you can really adapt more quickly? For sure. Uh, seeing it constantly over and over these uh, last, what, five, six games? Uh, just trying to adapt to that role. I say I like it. Uh, being able to facilitate the offense, keep moving it side to side, being able to be able to go downhill, get an attack in the rim. Uh, I say I, I like it. Um, just trying to move the ball and 
have a start for our offense. A big week in the news cycle for Fred Van Vliet. Of course, uh, he put to bed the rumors about the contract talks, and also he confirmed something that we had heard from Sherm Hamilton earlier <laughs> in the year, and that was the talk of why does Fred struggle right now as opposed to last year? And Sherm, you talked about the fact that the ball's out of his hands, and he talked about the mounting pressure as the game goes on, playing in a different role. Remind people what you said, why you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I just thought that the Raptors were, were playing differently, and, and, and some of that has to do with the emergence and the huge step Pascal has taken, so now he has the ball in his hands a lot more. And Scotty, you know, the free-flow offense and playmaking ability is spread across everybody on the floor. So that takes the ball out of Fred's hands more often than not. And that's an adjustment for a guy who's used to having the ball, initiating, making plays. But what we're seeing now is... We're getting back to Freddie getting the ball in his hands, and we see the production from that. You know, his ability to make plays, and we just talked about it earlier in the show, he hit a couple of big threes because he's that guy for this team. And when you have to do that without having the ball in your hands, there's going to be some fluctuations in terms of consistency. But if you have the ball in your hands throughout the game and now you got to make that play, there's a comfort level, there's Build a rhythm, rhythm you're in. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So last year Fred had the ball in his hands more. This year he doesn't. Injury has something to do with Fred's, you know, inconsistency at times. But it's a different adjustment when you don't have the ball in your hands the way you used to, but have the same expectations of offensive output and impact on a game. So, but we talk about it. Fred is a smart, he's a very professional, he's, he's one of the guys you want on your team, regardless of what's happening with him, because he's going to make a positive difference in what happens. And, and he's shown that this season. I think the other part of that, too, Sherm, that is really underplayed uh, is the mentality. Um, knowing that you don't have the ball in your hands and you have the same expectations and being in a state of mind where you're not forcing things. We've all seen guys that you see a shot on the court, it's like, well, I haven't touched the ball in a while shot, right? Like, I, I got the ball, I haven't had it in a while. It's my turn. Uh, yeah, it's my turn. I'm going to shoot it. Whether it's a good shot or not, I just need to get mine. And Fred doesn't play like that. So it even it magnifies even more the fact that for some people, wait, wait, hold on a second, he's not doing as much as he did before. We know, because he's, not, he's also not in that mindset of, oh, okay, I got the ball's time to get mine. He's playing for the team. And, and, and that's, the, that's the thing that you want, a guy that, I mean, this is a sacrifice. But you take, sometimes you take a step sideways or a step back to hopefully move forward, right? It, when th when things are implemented, they always get worse before they get better. And hopefully th the Raptors are past that stage now and they're moving forward. Well, let's hear it straight from the horse's mouth. This is a clip from the J.J. Reddick podcast, the most recent episode featuring the Toronto Raptors point guard, Fred. From a stylistic point, the way we were playing um, last year was just kind of free and easy. And I think I was much more a focal point with just on-ball duties and having the ball the whole game and being able to kind of dictate where I wanted to go. And this year that's changed a little bit. Um, so I'm kind of just like, you know, catching the rhythm. So you know how it goes some nights, the ball finds you some nights it doesn't. And the nights where it doesn't, those are the nights that I'm struggling this year, where it's like the out of rhythm games where I may get a couple catching shoes, couple contested ones, couple ones off the dribble, not getting to the foul line. And then, you know, I get three wide open ones at the end of the night when we need them. And if I make them, we win. If I miss them, we lose. I've had probably like four or five of those games. So I think it's a big drop off from like where I was as far as an all-star caliber point guard to where I am now. But I think it's pretty situational too in terms of where we are as a team. All right, time to shift focus now to Tuesday night's matchup with the Charlotte Hornets. And, when you're and talking, Thursday. Okay, Tuesday and Thursday, <laughs> yes, okay. Another one of those home and homes, an interesting feature of this year's version of the NBA. And when you talk about the Hornets, you talk about that backcourt, right? A lightning quick backcourt. And let's talk about Terry Rozier, Jonesy, and what he's brought to this group as kind of the leader and one of the best scorers on this roster. Yeah, he's, he's a guy that uh, has always been aggressive, um, always looks to score. Uh, here he is with the ball. And just just keep an eye on his decision making. Notices, drop coverage, gets to his spot. I mean, that's a practice shot. How many times has he done that in a gym by himself in the summer? He's also not bad away from the ball too. Uh, when you look at it, defense spread. He's out to the three point line. You know, a partial backdoor cut. 
And this play, we've seen it a lot. Clay Thompson hit a, uh, a shot to tie the game on this same play, does a great job of selling it, then uses the screen, and again, steps into a shot that he's practiced a million times. Um, good job in the screen and roll. Watch the attack on Steven Adams. Good shot prep. You watch Rozier, shuffles the feet, hands and feet ready, catch and shoot, knock it down. So he's a guy that, um, you know, the Raptors uh, really have to be, uh, really have to be aware of. He, he's, he's, he's kind of the head of the snake. He and LaMelo Ball, both of them together. I mean, we always used to say good guard play keeps you in games. At this juncture, at this evolution of the NBA, Good perimeter play, good guard games, good guard play is going to win you games. Now, the Hornets have leaned on a lot of Terry Rozier this year, but they finally got LaMelo Ball healthy, mm-hmm. averaging around eight assists a game. Yeah. Talk to us about the potency of his passing ability. Well, he can really do a great job at kind of orchestrating and making plays. Here you see him, he tacks into the middle. He's got the ball in one hand. No, you shouldn't leave your feet to pass the ball, <laughs> but on that level and his skill set, does a great job faking out the corner, finding the top. And here you see him screen and roll, rejects the screen, Defender on the bottom comes up to help. It's an easy lob over the top. Great recognition, and he's got all kinds of stuff in his game. And if you're going to try and defend him on a screen and roll and drop coverage, you're dead. He's going to have too many options. And here it's just a simple pocket bounce pass, easy plumly dunk. And then how about this? This left-handed slingshot of a pass cross court into the corner to Kelly Oubre and an easy (laughs) wide-open three-point shot. You can't do that. (laughs) If you don't have his skill set, and you look at his numbers this season, he's scoring the ball as well. So it's not just his passing, but his passing can definitely compromise your defense. He's the kind of guy you just can't defend by staying in front. You have to play passing lanes. You have to make sure he doesn't, he's just, because he's got size, he just isn't able to just throw it by your ear. You got to make sure your hands are active, and the Raptors are really good in terms of deflections and turnovers. Somewhere, grade school coaches are saying, "Don't do that." Right? Don't look at him. Don't left look at hand, the tape. Left hand hook pass cross court, like or don't jump into the lane and go into the basket in the air and yeah. slingshot it to the top. To That's at that level. To at this every level, rule, there's yeah. exceptions. At this level, <laughs> he's the passing version of Steph Curry. That guy can do it. Yeah. All right. Well, the six-game homestand continues for the Toronto Raptors. A 7:30 tip-off. You can catch the game on TSN and the radio call on Sportsnet 590 Tuesday night from the Scotiabank Arena, aka the Vault. I'm Akil Augustine. On behalf of Sherm, Jonesy, Nikhil, and Jake, we thank you guys for watching, and we will see you when we see them. Wednesday. 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 Let's do it Wednesday. again. Let's do it again. Yeah.